And obviously, the, the, so what we kind of created, I suppose, is a kind of talking shop for our industry. And what it's done is brought together, in a sense, it's brought together several communities of practice. It's brought together, I talked at the beginning about this idea, we have a group of people that have the same domain, same practice, but are in different communities. So there's the community of academics, the community of students, the community of professional practitioners, the community of photo editors, and people that work with photography. We've created a space that kind of spans all of those different communities, and a space where they can come together and talk about practice in a very open way, and in quite a sort of fine-grained way, as well as a very general way. So some reflections on the whole process, and then I guess we'll open it up for some, some discussion. Um, I think one of the key things, I said this in my session this morning, I'm not sure if you were there, but we, we essentially leverage an existing investment. That was both in terms of the technology, in terms of we use Wimba, which is the university's web conferencing platform that we paid for. Uh, but more importantly than the technology, I think we leveraged the pedagogic or the teaching and learning investment we've made in developing a methodology of, of, of webinars and, and blogs and Twitter. So we kind of knew how to use those tools already. We developed that kind of expertise and we just took that out into, into the professional practice area. And so it's that kind of um, conceptual investment, if you like, that we've made that we leverage very, very effectively. I think that's a really important thing to think about. Don't reinvent the wheel, don't start from scratch. Take something you've already worked through, you already know how to do, and try and roll that out into a, a broader community. And, and the other thing that's worked very, very well, obviously, is, and this is, I guess, where we get our, our ROI in terms of the teaching and learning. And this is where the, the project is essentially becoming self-sustaining. It's giving us fantastic, fantastic insights into what industry wants and needs and is doing at the moment. And that means our feedback loop between what we're teaching on the course, how we're preparing our students for professional practice, and the practice world is very, very short. You know, we can see that, for example, multimedia is really, really taking off in the practice area. We can go and find the key leaders in that. We can ask them questions about what they're doing, and that feeds straight back into our teaching and learning. So it's really, really provided huge benefits for our course in terms of keeping the course current, up to date, very reflective of professional practice. And obviously, it's also a space for our students uh, to, act, to, to actively participate in that broader community of practice for, for being professional. And it's acting as a kind of transition zone for them from the academy, from the university, into professional practice. They're able to make connections, they're able to make friends. Their identity on the network is as a photographer, not as a student. So they're able to kind of very quickly segue into the professional practice arena. It's so, almost like kind of a ready-made alumni network for them. They just step straight into that other network. They're connecting with people. They're able to, to communicate with, with, with their peers. Uh, one thing that worked very, very well was you had, we just, as part of the GIST project, we had a paid evaluator. So it was excellent to be able to get that constant iterative feedback on the project. We, we had a kind of continuous process of asking people how they were going. The evaluator didn't know very much about photography, but was a, a well-trained a, a well academic evaluator. And she sat in on most of the webinars, which she found fascinating, but equally she was able to kind of look at the interactions that were happening, levels of interaction, who was interacting, who wasn't, and so on and so forth. The feedback's been very, very positive um, from more or less all of the different people that are involved in it. And, and you know, it, it, it's kind of confirmed a lot of what I've been saying so far and certainly confirmed why we started the project up. It's been a very, very good driver for all sorts of people in all sorts of ways in terms of developing their professional practice. But the, one of the key things we got back was feedback from academics saying, what's great about this is I've got my theories about what happens in practice. I'm able to go out to practice and ask them very directly, you know, I think this is the case. Do you agree with me? So it's been a great way for the academic community to get really good data from the horse's mouth, as it were. And I think that's one of the key things that we can, we can do, is we can act as the broker, as it were, between the kind of research academics and professional practice, and act as a space in which those two areas can come together. You know, a lot of the time we're arguing about how do we bridge the gap between industry, professional practice, and, and the university? How do we sort of translate, as it were, that, that space? And I think this is a great way to do it, by using this kind of, this kind of approach. Um, the fact that it's in real time was really popular. People really like the immediacy and the, the energy, the emotional energy, I guess, of being in a live webinar. But they also like the fact that it's your own time. They can go, they can download it, they can listen to it later on. Uh, we, we host the archives of the webinars as, as videos on Vimeo. So there's a good chance for people to go back and listen to them again and get a sort of sense of, of what's, what's, uh, what's been happening. And this idea of in-between time that I'm really beginning to play with a lot. This sort of real, almost real world, almost real time, but not quite space, which is kind of what I call Twitter space, really. This sort of sense of being all, you know, almost a real time information feedback loop that you can get. 
Um, I'm just going to finish by talking about some of the roles that we, that, we, that we played, as it were, in this process, and some of the roles that I think are key to creating a sort of uh, a, a small-scale community of practice as we did. Uh, one is obviously the community coordinator. I think that that was me, um, and I effectively worked about a day a week on the project. I now work about half a day a week on it, which we've managed to find sort of funding internally for, uh, basically on that, because of this issue of it feeding back into the curriculum, alumni development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one of the ways we managed to make it sustainable was I went out and found partner organisations that were interested in hosting the webinars for us. So we've now got four or five different other groups external to our institution who, on a regular basis, will do the kind of legwork, as it were, of finding people to participate, and they will sort of, they'll host the webinar, we'll provide the technical support and the platform for them, but they'll actually do the work of recruiting the speakers, publicizing and putting it out on their websites and so on. And we've now got a kind of regular coterie of, of other people who are able to provide us with content, essentially, which has worked very, very well. Um, for me, that I've, I've essentially been the technology steward as well. This is Wenger and, and, and Co's kind of latest sort of incarnation of one of the key members of a, of a virtual community of practice, somebody who's able to sort of act again as the broker between the technology and the community, help the community identify what are the most important or what are the most valuable tools that it might, it might utilize or might develop. Um, the project evaluator, I said, was very, very important. It was great to have somebody whose job it was, was to actually, with some rigor, qualitatively and quantitatively assess what we were doing. And we got great feedback that from that, particularly in that first year of the project uh, running. It really helped us a lot in terms of keeping ourselves on track in that sense. And probably the key person in the process was the project administrator. They were paid, um, I think, half a day a week for, through the whole process. And having somebody to tidy up all the boring loose ends, behind the scenes stuff, keeping the Ning site tidy, uh, making sure that people were reminded when the webinars were, um, during the webinars, having a second person who was able to handle the technical issues behind the scenes. Those sorts of issues were very, very important. But the sorts of things it's quite hard people to get someone to do as a volunteer. I think by, by having somebody who was paid to do that, it meant those jobs got done. And I think having somebody that you can tell to do a job because they're being paid for it is a really valuable thing to have in a community of practice. And one of the big problems, I think, with instrumentalizing them, and this is a, a, an issue that Will raised at the beginning, was, you know, there's a lot of lip service paid in institutions to communities of practice, particularly at the moment. It's kind of the, great, the latest buzzword. But it's very rare that they're properly funded or properly supported. And, and a lot of people are expected to do it almost as, you know, out of nothing. You know. And I think it's very important to kind of write the business case almost that, a community, that it needs a certain amount of staff support in order for it to work. So I think I'll leave it there with some time for questions. We've got, I guess, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes or so. So um, very happy to answer any questions. Or we've... We've got a Google Doc started just before the session started with some questions we could maybe engage with a little bit anyway, because it seems like we've got quite a lot of, of experience anyway in the room. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you in a way to, um, to open the discussion. Well, Paul, <coughs> what would you see as being the difference between a community of practice and a user group? That's a very good question. I'll just get Etienne on the phone, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's... I think it's um, I think one of the first things to, take, to, to make sure is that when, when, when we're talking about community in this context, it doesn't have to be a touchy, feely, cuddly, warm space. It can actually be quite a spiky, quiet, you quite know, unpleasant space. Because when Etienne's talking about community in this context, he's kind of done what he's done, he's kind of adopted the word in his own terminology. So it's not necessarily the community in the sense we tend to think of community as being something very, very positive, very, very cosy. So I think it's that sense of, um, a, 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 an engagement, a collaborative engagement with the practice and the domain that goes beyond the user group, I guess. It's sort of that sense of just going that next step beyond the user group into something that's much more vibrant and something more that's more kind of, has more energy to it, I suppose. Yeah, I think some of them certainly the pressure groups, don't they? I mean, that's, that's quite a legitimate sort of yeah. ambition, if you like, of setting up a community. Of Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the key things at the beginning is, you know, is the community practice model the one that you want? Or actually, do you want a user group or do you want a pressure group or do you want something else? So I think it's important, as I said, one of the big problems at the moment is because it has become instrumentalised, lots of people are sort of applying this term very, very loosely and very vaguely without really any precision and not really trying to kind of think, is the community practice actually what I need or do I need some other form of, you know, 
whatever it might be. It might be a staff development program or it might be a, a pressure group, as you yeah. said. You know.